Hey there, Southridge. Um, I've missed you. It's really good to be with you again, um, getting to share a message that I am super excited about. We are starting a new series. It's a seven-week series, and it's tile, titled, It's a Miracle. And we're, we're still in the book of Matthew, which we have been all year long, 2021. We've been in the book of Matthew. And we're going to look in this next seven weeks at some of the miracles that Jesus did. Um, he was a miracle worker. Jesus was a miracle worker. Supernatural things happened when he was in the middle of them, when he was present. Supernatural things happened. So in this series, we're going to be encouraged. Um, I know I'm going to be encouraged, and I hope today to encourage you uh, that you would expect something great from God, that you would expect to see the miracle maker, the miracle worker in the midst of your life. Would you join me as we, as we pray? And then we're going to jump into a great text of, of scriptures here. Father, we um, ask that you, God, today, right now, in this moment, in this message, would move in our lives so much that, God, there would be an anticipation. There would be a level of trust and faith that rises up, that, that doesn't come from ourselves, but comes truly from you, from seeing you in a way that perhaps we've never seen you before. So God, take these words and magnify them, that your spirit, God, would, would cause change to happen in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Um, so what is a miracle, right? That's the first question. How do you define a miracle? A miracle is supernatural. A miracle is something that is outside of the ordinary. It's beyond the normal. It's unexplained. There's, you can't really explain a miracle. When I look at my life, I think of numbers, many, many miracles that I have personally experienced. If you knew me or you knew my husband before Jesus met us, you would say, you are a miracle. And I would agree. My life uh, is a miracle from, from who I was before Jesus to who I am now is truly a miracle. It's a, it's a changed life that is unexplainable. I didn't do anything crazy. I didn't plan it out. God just met me and did a miracle. A few months ago, I was challenged at a conference to, to think about the miracles that God did, and it, it made me start to write down miracles, miracles that I have seen in, in some of your lives, um, in some of my family's lives, in some of the people that I don't even know, but I've watched from afar. I've seen miracles, and I started writing them down, and it gets longer and longer and longer. Maybe, maybe you could do that in these next seven weeks. Maybe you could start writing down miracles. Because when I started writing them down, I was like, wow, I have forgotten how many miracles you have done in my own life. And I think you will be too. So, so maybe start writing down some miracles. Uh, many times, though, many times we expect nothing from God or have given up on God's hand moving in our lives. So prayerfully, that's my prayer, is during this series, during this message today, that you will consider or reconsider God's miracles, the miracles that God can do, and that you too can come to expect God to do something, expect the miracle maker to move in your situation, in your life. So the key text for this whole series for the next seven weeks comes out of Matthew 19, 26, and this is what it says. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. We're going to talk about that a lot. Um, can you believe with me that the impossible could become possible? Could you believe with me that the impossible would become possible? I'm going to go into a text uh, today that's in Matthew again, and it's, it's Matthew 23 through 27, and we're going to read through it in, in its entirety first, and then we're going to come back through, and we're going to walk through verse by verse and talk about it. And then we're going to talk about three, three Jesus statements that you and I can grab a hold of, and then a practical six-point application that maybe you and I could start to implement in our lives that would maybe change the way that we see miracles or expect a miracle. So let's jump in. I'm going to read through um, Matthew 8, 23 through 27. It says, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came 
upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Wow. Wow. Okay, so here's the big idea. The big idea is nothing is too big for Jesus. Just stop whatever you're doing right now and just think about that. If you hear nothing else that I say for the rest of this message, hear that. Nothing is too big for Jesus. In fact, say it with me. Where you're sitting at your kitchen table, driving in your car, say it with me. Nothing is too big for Jesus. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So I want to set the stage. Before this text of scriptures, um, the disciples had had just been with Jesus. They had, they had seen him do healings. They had seen him do miracles. They had sat underneath his teaching. Can you imagine sitting with the Savior and hearing all of his teachings? Um, similar to you and I, maybe we've heard a lot about Jesus. Maybe we've opened up scripture and we've read it for ourselves. We've even studied it with other people about it. But sometimes just hearing it doesn't really apply to us or change us until we have to experience it. And Jesus had just finished with some of the hard sayings. That we talked about hard sayings in our series right before this. And, and the hard sayings were, you can't go bury your father. You need to follow me. Um, you got to go the extra mile when you don't want to. You want to be done. Um, so similar to you and I, we, we hear about those and, and, and we don't really know how to apply it. But maybe Jesus is saying from those hard sayings that we just heard, come all in. And then you're going to see a miracle happen in your life. Give me your all. Make me number one, and then maybe you'll see the miracle. So here's another interesting thought, is often we want to see miracles, right? We say, I wish God would do a miracle in my life. And then we're in a situation that requires a miracle. And the first thing we do is we start to complain. Why am I here? What's going on? Just a thought. I just... Just want to throw that out there to think about. But anyway, let's go back to our, our very, big, for, very first scripture in, in 23. And it says this. It says, then he got into the boat and his disciples followed after him. So he got into the boat. It, it, was, it was because they were going to go across the Sea of Galilee. They lived in a village at Capernaum is where they were at. Jesus was with his disciples. And they were going to get into this boat. They were familiar with boating. They were fishermen. They lived on a lake. Um, so this wasn't an abnormal event. They were, they were familiar with the boat. They were familiar with the life on a very, fairly large lake. Um, and earlier in Matthew, Jesus said, let's cross to the other side, just a few verses back up. So they knew that they were getting in the boat, not to just go whip around or jet ski or boat or whatever. You know, They were getting in the boat with a purpose. They were going to go to the other side. He knew, they knew that they were going to cross to the other side. And perhaps they went on a boat instead of walking around. Jesus did a lot of walking because he needed a break. Maybe. Maybe he just needed a break. On to verse 24. It says in 24, Suddenly a furious storm came upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was asleep. Suddenly. That's a key word. If you're like me, for me, A lot of my storms in my life that I have faced came suddenly. It was unexpected. It was out of nowhere. And I think that sometimes, many times, when suddenly happens in our life, it it could expose what's really in our hearts. We don't have a chance to prepare. It's just suddenly, and then our hearts are exposed to what's there. So the Sea of Galilee um, was known for its sudden violent storms. It it was common for that to happen. The boat, the boat, imagine they're in this boat and all of a sudden the waves are crashing so much over the waves that you can't even see the boat in there. And then they're, they're crashing over the boat and the water's starting to fill up in the boat and, and it's, it's getting deep and it's getting scary and the disciples were afraid. It was gradually filling with water. But our text says Jesus was asleep. He was sleeping. He was tired. The guy was worn out. I mean, if you even go back a few verses and see what he was doing before he got on that boat, you'd say he had a full day's work. He was exhausted. He needed a little bit of a break. Um, two things that, to consider here with, 
with the idea that Jesus was sleeping the first one is that he was human. He needed rest. So don't ever think that Jesus cannot identify with your humanity, with your, your temptations, with your weariness. With, he was human. He can relate. That's the beautiful thing of why God sent him to this earth in a human fleshly form without sin, but he was still made in the flesh. The second thought is that it conveys a real dramatic um, contrast, the storm and sleeping. It's interesting, and it's also intriguing, that Jesus could sleep through a storm like this. He was out. It wasn't like it was a quiet little boom out there. It was a storm that many, none of them slept, but Jesus was sleeping. So the big idea here for this is the big Jesus statement is Jesus is bigger than my feelings. He's bigger than my feelings. So sometimes it's as though Jesus is unaware. He's not concerned. He's sleeping. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe the storm that you're in today, if you're in a storm, maybe the storm that you're in, you feel like he's unaware. He doesn't even know what's going on. We feel as though he's too busy. We feel as though he's too important. He's got too much going on to think about me and what I'm going through. Our feelings can deceive us, but Jesus does not. And the truth of who he is does not. So we cannot base everything on how we feel. There's a song that's called Waymaker, right? And it says, uh, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Because you are the way maker. You're the miracle worker. You're the promise keeper. So we got to remember who he is in the middle of our storms and how we feel doesn't change the fact that he is still consistent, faithful in who he says he is. He doesn't change. So Jesus is bigger than my feelings. Now let's go on to verse 25. It says, The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith. Why are you so afraid? So at the moment, at that moment, the disciples had more fear of the storm than they had trust in God. They had more fear of the storm than trust in God. Jesus asked them, why are you so afraid? He wasn't mad that, he, that they woke him up. Um, rather, he just, he just questioned their fear and their unbelief. He wasn't upset at the fear he was upset more at their fear than, than anything because fear and unbelief go hand in hand. They go together. So when we're afraid, we're basically saying, I don't believe that God's good enough. I don't believe that God's big enough. I don't believe that he is bigger than what I'm facing. They even had Jesus right there in the boat with them, and they saw him sleeping. You'd, you'd almost think that just, I'm in this violent storm, and there's Jesus right here sleeping. I should be calm. I should, I should know that if he's at peace with what this crazy is going out that on around me, that I can be at peace too. So I find this statement, I found this statement from Charles Spurgeon, who is a great man of God, historically just deep and wise and rich. If you ever get to read anything by Charles Spurgeon, you want to read it. It's just really rich and deep. He made this one statement about this text of scriptures, and it, it was interesting, and I found it somewhat convicting. It says, he spoke to the men first. So in when they woke him up, he spoke men, first to the men, for they were the most difficult to deal with. Wind and sea could be rebuked afterwards. And I thought about that, like, is it possible that, that he spoke to the men first because our hearts are what really need to be changed in the middle of the storm? Maybe it's our heart, maybe it's your heart that needs to be changed in the middle of the storm that you're in, more so than the circumstances that are causing the storm that you're in. Maybe, just maybe, God is wanting to change your heart in the middle of it. So life storms seem to pop up. They seem to pop up when you least expect them. And if you're in the middle of the storm, it seems like your boat is about to sink. Your first reaction may likely be very similar to the disciples on the Sea of Galilee that day. It may be fear. It may be fear. But God's message... To you and to me today, and throughout all the pages of Scripture, every page of Scripture says to fear not. 
fear not. Jesus' second great statement is Jesus is bigger than my fear. He is bigger than all of my fears. Jesus is bigger than the storm that they were facing on the sea of Galilee that day. We know from, from 1 John 4, 8 that it says that perfect love casts out all fear. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So is it possible that we are lacking in our understanding and acceptance of his great love and that's why we fear? Is it possible today that maybe you don't really understand or really believe that God loves you and that's why you're so afraid in the middle of the storm that you're in. Don't lose heart. He's in the storm with you. He is truly there. They said, we're going to drown. So if we allow, that's what they decided, we're going to drown. They went and woke him and said, we're going to drown. So if we allow our fears to distract us, our expectations from God, if, if they distract what we expect from God, we focus more on the problem then the solution, we, we give more attention to the, what is your storm? You fill in the blank. What are you giving more attention to? What are you giving more attention to that God's saying, wait a minute, I'm in here. Give me the attention. Focus on me. I'm the one that can calm the storm. I'm the one that can change your heart in the middle of the storm. Go, go to verse 26. It says, then he got up. You have little faith. Then he got up, verse 26. Sorry, mine's a little bit different. It says, then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves. It was completely calm. And the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So Jesus rebuked the winds. We're going to talk about that in just a minute because that's interesting too. It was nothing to him, nothing to rebuke him. He didn't even question if the earth's tilt had changed or what the distance from the sun was, or even if the temperature of the air pressures were different, all those things that cause a storm to happen. He didn't question all of those. He just rebuked them. He just stopped the storm, just like that. Just spoke it and stopped it. And the men marveled. The, the disciples were amazed. Such powerful display over creation led them to ask the very question in our text, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. It could only be the Lord Jehovah that could do something like this. Psalms 89, 8 and 9, I love this. It says, who is like you, Lord, God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you steal them. Some of you might need to put this on a plaque and post it in your house because your waves are really high and you need to remind yourself that he is the one that will steal them. So let's go on to our third Jesus statement. Jesus is bigger than my circumstances. He's bigger than your storm. He's bigger than your situation. He's bigger than your circumstances. He got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves. Jesus has authority over every single wave in your life. He has authority over every single storm that is in your life. Jesus brings the calm. The circumstances of life's events, our goals, the bank accounts, uh, friends on social media, um, our finances, our health issues, the relationship struggles that we're facing, they aren't our reference points. We don't look at that as our reference point. We look to Jesus. He's our reference point. He's the one that I'm looking at. I'm keeping my eyes on him. He arose, it says, and he rebuked the winds and the sea. He didn't quiet them. He didn't hush them. He rebuked. That's a strong word. So looking at, at the preceding verses of what happened, some of the stuff that, that maybe indicates that perhaps he knew what was coming. Perhaps the enemy knew what was coming. Perhaps it was an idea that when we get to the other side of this lake, it says, if you read it on, he, he met demon-possessed guy that the demon was cast out of him into the pigs. It's, it's like a spiritual battle. So I'm wondering if maybe the storm that you're in 
is such a storm because maybe, maybe your deliverance is on the other side. Maybe your deliverance is on the other side. It's right around the corner. When the boat reached the other side, Jesus was met with some great darkness and great deliverance came. If you're in the middle of a storm and and you feel like something is going to happen, but this crazy is going on, don't give up. Don't give up. Your deliverance, your victory, your miracle might be right on the other side of the lake. Don't give up in the storm. Look to the miracle maker. Expect a great miracle because we serve a God of miracles. We serve a God that is supernatural, that is out of the ordinary, that is beyond normal, that is unexplainable in how and when he does things. So Jesus' disciples were confronted with a furious storm in the Sea of Galilee. And maybe um, they needed a miracle. They did. And perhaps you're facing a storm of a different sort today. Maybe you're facing a, a furious storm with your boss. Maybe you're facing a a furious spouse or a furious child or a furious financial bank account or maybe you're facing a furious health diagnosis. Maybe you're facing your own storm that's furious, that's wreaking havoc on your health emotionally or physically or on your relationships and you need a miracle. You need Jesus to calm your storm. You need him to calm your storm. He is the one, the only one, that can calm the storms in our life. But too often, we focus on the storms rather than on him. The disciples did it, and they had just, they had just been with him face-to-face, one-on-one, saw miracles, saw great things, and they still, they still struggled not to look at the circumstances. So I want to I walk through just six real quick points on things to to help us stay in a position to see the miracles, to keep our eyes on the miracle maker and not the situations or the circumstances or the fears or our feelings that try to inundate us and drown out the voice of our miracle maker. Okay, I'm going to go through them real quick. The first one is to remember the promise. Remember the promise. Jesus had said in Matthew 8.18, this was early on, that we're going to go over to the other side he told his disciples. Um, they, they maybe hadn't been paying attention when he told them that because if they would have remembered that, they would have been in the boat and said, wait a minute, he already told us that we're going over to the other side. He was going over. He didn't say we're going to go under. We're going to take you out in the, in the lake and we're going to drown. He didn't say that. So I'm convinced for you too that Jesus has the same plan for you today, that he didn't say you're going to drown in the situation and the circumstance that you're in. He said that you would arrive there if you hang on and trust him. Eternity is promised to those who believe in the promise. So no matter how scary the storm is, no matter how difficult the situation is, you can be confident that he will bring you to the other side. Remember the promise. Jesus is bigger than your circumstance. Remember his promises. Number two, leave the crowd behind. Leave the crowd behind. We know that Jesus got into the boat, his disciples got in the boat, and they left the crowd. It says in our text, it says in the other versions in Mark, they left the crowd behind. The miracle maker is alive in your life. If you're going to see him alive in your life, if you're going to see him really shine in your life like you want to, like I want him to, it's unlikely that we're going to be Mr. and Mrs. Pop- popularity around this world. It's, it's probably not going to happen. So can you choose to leave the crowd behind? It's significant. It's significant because a lot of the people in your crowd right now that you're dealing with are not chanting and cheering you on to your faith in Jesus. They're not. They're not looking at the miracle maker with you. They're easy and quick to complain about everything hard that comes your way. They're easy and okay to live a life of mediocrity. You're not. I'm not. We don't want to. They're, they're okay to have uneventful lives. Rather than risking any storms on their journey to the other side of the lake, they would prefer to eliminate the risks. They would prefer to eliminate and take the safer route. Perhaps just trying to walk around to the other side. But remember this. You'll never see a miracle maker making miracles if you stand on the edge and don't jump in. Leave the crowd behind. It's okay. 
It's okay. He, the miracle maker, is with you. Number three, make sure you're taking Jesus with you. Make sure you're taking him with you on the inside of the boat. This is so basic, but so easily overlooked. I think about in Luke where it says that they were with Jesus as, as a young boy, and they started to travel on his, his mom and dad, Joseph and Mary, and all of a sudden they realized Jesus wasn't there. They had, they had left him. Well, they didn't leave him in this one. The disciples took him along. And if you're going to go through a storm, if you're in the middle of the storm, I would highly suggest it's really good for you to have Jesus in that storm with you. I see a lot of times Christians go through storms and they leave Jesus out. It's a weird thing. It's super weird. But they'll leave him out of the middle of the storm and they feel like they can just make it through without him. But bring the miracle maker into your situation. Because until the storm hits, you may feel safe enough without him. But as the storm hits, you need him in there. So put him in there now. Start talking to him. Start having conversations with him. It's dangerous to be in a storm without Jesus in your boat. So invite him into your storm. Invite him in there. Keep him in there. Number four, number four, to stay, to stay in a position of a miracle. Um, don't doubt his love for you. Don't doubt his love. Seeing Jesus asleep in the midst of the storm, the disciples reacted the same way you and I probably would. Waking him up, they questioned his love. It says in Mark, they, they worded it like this. Teacher, don't you even care if we drown? Whew. Their logic was flawed, but we've all wondered the same things at time. Come on, be honest. Have you ever wondered that? Lord, do you really love me? Do you really care about me? Look at this storm raging around me. Do you really love me? You wouldn't allow me to go through a storm like this if you loved me. But there's a song I want you to remember. And I'm pretty sure everybody knows it in this this whole world. I'm pretty sure we all know it. And it is this. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Instead of doubting his love while we're experiencing a storm, let's look for his love. Don't doubt his love for us. Look for it in the middle of the storm. That in itself is a miracle. When you see Jesus in the middle of your storm, that's a miracle. You see him there. Jesus is bigger than your feelings. Number five, be patient when you're halfway across the, across the lake. You're going through the lake and you're going through life and you're in the middle of the storm and you're not there yet. You can see the shore, but you're not quite there yet. Hang on. I heard a great evangelist say one time, tie a knot and hang on. Help is on its way. Don't jump out of the boat to drown when you're in the middle of a storm. Stay. Stay there because you're going to get to the other side, and Jesus is going to meet you in the middle of it. We can't lose heart when we're halfway there. I have a note in my, in my house that says, God is preparing me for what he has prepared me for. I'm going to trust him at the halfway point, because I know that in the middle of a storm, he's preparing me for something greater that he has for me, and he has the same thing for you. So don't lose heart. Number six is stir up the faith within you. He asked the disciples, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? How about you? I'm going to ask you the same question. Why are you so afraid? Fear and unbelief go hand in hand. Do you believe that Jesus is bigger than your storm? Our faith in him must be awakened. This sounds kind of, what does that mean? It says that um, in Isaiah... I want you to just pause just a minute. Just just slow down with whatever you're doing, wherever you're at. Just just slow down for a second. I want you to to really consider this. Take a moment and let God speak to your heart right now. Do you believe in his faithfulness? Do you believe he is faithful? Do you believe he will not let you drown? Isaiah 64 says, The prophet Isaiah says, no one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. I don't want to be a no one. I want to call on his name. I want you to call on his name. I want us to stir up our faith. I want us to arouse ourselves to take hold of what God has for us, to take hold of the miracle maker himself. To fan that flame in Timothy, it says, 2 Timothy 1.6, it says, stirring up 
fanning the flame, something that we must do on a regular basis. It says, for this reason, I remind you to fan the flame of the gift of God, which is in you. So in closing real quick, I want to just say that when Jesus gave orders to go to the other side, he already knew that there was a storm. He knew. He's omniscient. He knows everything. So he already knows the storm that is maybe brewing in you. He decided to launch out at the sea anyway. And the Lord never promised any of us. Nowhere in scripture does he promise you will never face a storm. As a matter of fact, he told us to expect it. To expect it in this broken world. But rather he has promised that he will be with us in the storm. He will never leave his children alone in the midst of trouble. They will with perseverance, overcome. So here's the reality. You are either headed into a storm, you're in the middle of a storm, or you're coming out of one. And you need a miracle. You need a miracle. And Jesus is bigger than our feelings. Jesus is bigger than our fears. And Jesus is bigger than our circumstances. So I'm going to ask you today, would you, would you call out to him? Would you let your eyes look at Jesus, who is bigger than our fears, our feelings, or our circumstances? Because when we look at him, we will see miracles. He is the miracle maker. Do you pray with me as I close? Father, We need you to fan that flame in us, God. We need you to show us that you are a miracle maker. We're in the middle of a storm, Lord. You know that person that is listening to my voice right now that is in the middle of a storm, and they don't know what to do. Part of them wants to jump out. But God, they need you. They need a miracle. So Jesus, I pray that they would cast their eyes on you that they would, they would look at you, God, the promises that are yes and amen, that you never leave us and you never forsake us, and that you are a God that is faithful, faithful, faithful. So stir that faith in us, God, to trust you regardless of our circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.